pleasure ma'am pleasure so i welcome uh, dr bernard welcome sir so we will uh, begin the meeting father so harish you can start when you find an idea that can't stop thinking about that's probably a good one to pursue happy and a sparkling morning to the very bright and spirited audience who have assembled here on this online platform to witness the inauguration of the 7th annual conference of the loyal forum for historical research lfhr centered on the theme echoing the subaltern voices at the national and regional levels it's indeed a matter of nonchalant pride for the department of history loyal college to have organized this intellectual congregation of scholars as a matter of respect i'm pleased to welcome mr p sainab founder editor people's archive of rural india as the chief guest for this inaugural session i also thank all the prestigious dignitaries of our college for gracing this occasion and for acting as torch bearers of vision and progress for the overall development of our students A special mention to dr d anuradha head of the department of history and mr j ranganathan coordinator department of history shift to for organizing this conference it's become a regular aspect and part of the department's culture to organize such academically enriching and empowering endeavors on behalf of the department i once again take moment to pride and prestige in welcoming you all to the 7th annual conference of the loyal forum for historical research a leader knows the way goes the way and shows the way now we have in our midst a leader who walks the talk and shows a bright path for her followers i cordially invite dr d anuradha head of the department of history to please ma'am thank you jeevit well, good morning to all and all present here it is my pleasure to welcome each of you to the 7th annual national conference of the loyal art forum for historical research titled echoing the subaltern voices at the national and regional levels writings in modern indian history i extend a warm welcome to our beloved principal reverend dr thomas sj welcome father thank you for encouraging us and enabling us to organize such academic programs from the very inception of the idea of hosting the conference father has guided us and supported us he has encouraged us to bring out the proceedings of the conference and we will be working on it once the paper presentations are over in this two day session once again i welcome you father i welcome mr sainath founder editor of people's archive of rural india and illustrious alumnus of the department of history sir thank you for accepting our invite and being with us here today when we came up with the theme we unanimously came up with the decision that we must invite you to deliver the inaugural address because of the tremendous work you have been doing in bringing out the voices of the unheard our salutations to your immense dedicated work and to your dedicated volunteers as well we are eagerly waiting to listen to you especially your experience while working on your latest project the last heroes foot soldiers of india's freedom our whole hearted welcome to you sir i am happy to welcome dr bernard e sami director loyal institute of social sciences training and research lister former head of the department of history and above all our beloved teacher he is our mentor and we look to him for guidance and direction sir has been guiding us and directing us the right way in organizing this conference right from the beginning he has helped us in every stage of organizing the event i thank you sir for being a strong pillar of support and showing us the way forward i welcome you sir i extend a whole hearted welcome to our uh, dear uh, dr milkes gabriel deputy principal and uh, mr ranganathan the coordinator of shift 2 for all the support they have extended towards the conduct of this conference welcome dear sir i extend a whole hearted welcome to our dear participants we are overwhelmed by the enthusiasm and support we received from our faculty research scholars and students of uh, institutions i welcome you and wish you a very enriching experience i also take this moment to welcome dr neeta kanpekar a chairperson for the first session and uh, she is a professor from the university of mumbai thank you madam for taking the time here to be with us for this inaugural session 
I uh, extend my wholehearted welcome to my colleagues from the Department of History and from the uh, various uh, uh, colleges uh, and also thank them for their untiring support in every stage of organizing the conference. I welcome all the UGPG students and research scholars to participate in this event. The Loyola Forum for Historical Research functions with the objective to kindle research among the budding research scholars and acts as a platform for stalwarts to showcase their acumen in research. It makes an important contribution by highlighting the significance, value, and credibility of historical studies through publications with special emphasis to regional studies. This year, LFHR has chosen the theme echoing the subaltern voices at the national regional level, writings in modern Indian history. It is an attempt to create a platform to discuss issues for socioeconomic perspective and understand a need to create a space for the unheard voices in the realm of social history. It is, an, it is also an attempt to relate to the contributions of such groups of society by whose efforts history has taken shape. Once again, a warm welcome to one and all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for nonchalantly delivering the opening remarks in your impeccable style. Never dream for success, but work for it. I now invite our exemplary principal, Reverend Dr. Thomas S.J., to felicitate the gathering. Please, Father. Thank you very much. Most respected Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. P. Sainat, uh, Dr. Nita, Professor at Mumbai University, Dr. Bernadi Swami, former HOD of his department and senior fellow in the uh, Lister Research Organization, Dr. Anuradha, HOD of his department, and Mr. Ranganathan, the coordinator of SHIFT 2, and our Dr. Melkias, our beloved deputy principal, all the faculty members, learned colleagues, and uh, my dear beloved students, greetings to all of you. I deem it my honor and pleasure to be part of this important intellectual discussion. I'm very happy the Department of History undertook this important reflection today on this critical theme, echoing the subaltern voices at the national and regional levels. The topic expresses one of the deepest longings of the people, of people whose stories never see the light of the day. We have a large majority of people whose existence means nothing to the people in power. Their socioeconomic conditions, geographical isolations, push them to the margins of our society, and they struggle for survival, struggle for rights and struggle for entitlements go unnoticed and documented and they do not have a voice. I'm happy Loyola Forum for Historical Research chose this theme for deeper reflection. Today there is a blatant move to rewrite history which questions the scientifically established facts. There are efforts to bury the historical struggles of people whose fight for their rights got subsumed into narratives. When an IIT professor refused the theory of Aryan invasion through a calendar, we see in it an attempt to rewrite history. When Muffler revolution is remembered after 100 years, you hear about diverse facts and interpretations of the rebellion. It will be interesting to know how the power, people in power named or documented or historical facts are assembled about the year-long struggle of the farmers on the borders of Delhi. One can go on listing attempts to state history from one's vantage points. Amidst this confusing reality, the concern is where do we find voice for the voiceless? Is there a platform for these people to write their history? History of their struggle for justice, equality, for their own rights and entitlements. My dear colleagues, what is essential today is the need to echo the voices in the bottom of the pyramid. I'm extremely happy that Dr. P. Soinath is giving this keynote address to this important reflection. 
all of you will agree with me. He has invested his entire life, all his earnings, in documenting the voices of the people who are in the margins, be it rural people, tribal people, Dalits. He has always stood by them and whatever within his capacity he can do to them to document their voices in whichever way media possible, he has done it. His life is a, uh, is a, is a, is a legacy legacy that speaks about the key theme that we have chosen for our reflection today. I'm extremely thankful to Dr. B. Sainath for accepting to be with us and to kickstart the reflection process. Sure, we have a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with us. We are going to uh, inspire our younger students who are here looking back to you for inspiration and guidance. Thank you very much, sir. I wish all the conference, all the best, all the participants to have a meaningful engagement in this vital topic so that this reflection will take us to take a position and represent the voice of the voiceless so that we are able to truly echo the longings of the people in the subaltern perspective. I wish all the, the organizers all the best. Have a very engaging and enriching day. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for inspiring us and leading us from the front like always. We'll definitely pay heed to your words and be the voice of the voiceless. Be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. Next up, we have a person whose love and guidance have inspired us to achieve great heights in life. Without much ado, I cordially request Dr. Bernard Isami, coordinator, Listar, to introduce our chief guest. Please, sir. Sir, sir, kindly kindly unmute your mic, sir, please. No, sir, it's not at, uh, still on mute, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. Now, okay, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Anuradha, for having given me the opportunity um, to introduce Dr. Uh, Sainath, also uh, to be part of the LFHR. Uh, I think the Department of History is a home away from home for all of us, starting with Professor Bertman and Mota and Dr. Miranda and the Munaswami. Professor Mota used to tell us the time, more time we spend in the department than at home. So that has been the tradition of the history department. And uh, our chief guest for the day, uh, Mr. Sainath, studied in our department. All of us are very proud, and every time in our department we have any function or speak one to one or to any group, we proudly tell that he is our distinguished alumni. So that way, it is always a pleasure and joy for me to introduce uh, Mr. Sainath. And every time when I introduce, I also get very inspired and uh, definitely, you know, would like to imitate the work that he is doing far excellent, uh, you know, to the rural poor. Having said that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, for the principal, uh, deputy principal, all my colleagues in the Department of History, Dr. Nita Kanpekar from uh, University of Mumbai, and many others who have joined us for this program. Now let me have the honor of introducing Sainat. Sainat studied the uh, <laughs> he studied uh, history in Loyola College, one year senior to me in the college, and uh, Sainath was the general secretary of the college union, very vibrant, and he was very active in the debating club of Loyola College. And after that, he went to the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Sainath started his career at the United uh, News of India in 1980. He then worked for Blitz and the Karanjia 
a major Indian weekly published from Mumbai. He was also its deputy editor uh, and he continued that for about 10 years. On June 28, 2021, less than a year, Sainath won the Fukuoka Grand Prize, one of Japan's most prestigious international awards that honors individual groups, organizations, who create as well as preserve the many distinct and diverse cultures of the Asian region. The last Indian winner of the Fukuoka Grand Prize was music maestro A.R. Rahman in 2016. In the 31 year history of the award, P. Sainath is the first Grand Prize laureate from the field of journalism. Sainath is contributing 5 million yen prize money for two purposes. 1 million to the families of the rural journalists who have lost their lives to COVID-19 and 2.3 million to set up the People's Archive of Rural India, PARI, fellowships for the rural, uh, rural journalists from Dalit and Adivasi communities. Sainath was awarded the 2007 Raman Magatese Award for Journalism, Literature, and creative communication art. He was given the award for his passionate commitment as a journalist to restore the rural power to India's national consciousness. He was the first Indian to win the Magasese in the category after R.K. Lakshman in 1984. Sainat became the first Indian reporter to win the European Commission Lorenzo Natali Prize for Journalism in 1995. In 2000, he won the inaugural Amnesty International Global Human Rights Journalism Prize. That same year, he was awarded the United Nations Food and Agriculture FAO's Borma Prize. In 2002, he was given the Inspiration Award of the Global Vision Film Festival in Edmonton, Canada. During the decade, China stood the 10 most backward districts in India poverty-stricken, drought-stricken states in India, this tour inspired him to write Everybody Loves a Good Drop. And this book is even today the bestseller. Sainath has not accepted government awards stating journalism should not be judged by government and journalists should not accept awards from governments they are covering or writing about. In 2009, he won the Ramnath Goenka Journalist of the Award, uh, Award for the Indian Express. On July 7, 2021, last year, less than a year ago, the government, uh, the government of the state of Andhra Pradesh announced the winners of its new YSR Lifetime Achievement Award. Sainath was the first name in the journalist category for this prize. That was, you know, the prize money was one million. 10 lakhs. He, however, turned down the prize as it is his belief that journalists should not accept awards from government. They cover and critique. In his words, the journalist is an external auditor to government. This is not the first time China has decided to stay, decided to take honors. He has never accepted one in the 40 years and has turned down several, including the Padma Bhushan. India's third highest civilian award in 2009 on the same grounds on which he declined the YSR Lifetime Achievement Award. Canadian documentary filmmaker Joe Mowlins made a film about Sainath titled A Tribe of His Own. When the jury at the Edmonton International Film Festival picked its winner, it decided to include Sainath in the award along with the maker of the film because this was an award about inspiration. Another documentary film, Nero's Guest, looks at inequality as manifest in Indian agrarian crisis through Sainath reporting in the subject. Nero's Guest won the Indian Documentary Producers Association Gold Medal for Best Documentary for 2010. He was awarded the Doctor of Letters degree honoris causa by the University of Alberta in Edmonton in 2011, and another deal it by St. Francis Xavier University, Nova Scotia in 2017. 
In 2012, he served as Megra Professor of Writing, Princeton University. At Princeton University, he was the Megra Professor of Writing, Princeton University in 2012. To on June 1st, 2015, Sainath became the first Thought Works Chair Professor in Rural India and Digital Knowledge at the Asian College of Journalism. He won the inaugural World Media Summit Global Award for Excellence. In 2014, in the public welfare for exemplary news professional in developing countries, Sainath so, is a founder editor of the People's Archive of Rural India, Pari. His heart is now with this organization. His full time mm -hmm. work with them. The archive is an outcome of the three decades plus journalism, including a quarter century of reporting from rural India. Pari aims to address the complete failure of the corporate media to cover two thirds of country's population. Our aim is to report and record what is easily the most complex part of the planet. With these words, uh, there is there is there is no better person or none other uh, than the uh, you know Sainath uh, to deliver a lecture or to deliver a lecture on eco wing. The subaltern voice. Over to Saina for the inaugural letter. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, uh, thank you, Father Principal. Thank you, Dr. Anuradha, for inviting me here. You know, one of my favorite sayings on history comes from Africa. It's a Swahili saying, and it tells you why you need to be covering subalterns. The old Swahili saying goes, if lions were historians, the tales of the jungle would not always favor the hunter. Yeah. If lions were historians, the stories of the jungle would not always favor the hunter. Another, a much more elegant way of putting the old one of History is written by the victors. So you have, in, in fact, uh, okay, let me begin by saying that uh, I'm here as a journalist. I am a journalist, working journalist, 41 years experience. But I never studied or trained in journalism or journalism schools. I have been teaching at those schools for 35 years. I was trained, one, as a student of history and as a historian at Loyola College and then at Jawaharlal Nehru University and was in the middle of my those then uh, joint MPhil PhD program when I quit to become a journalist. Two, I believe that anything worthwhile I may have achieved in journalism most significantly owes to my background and learning in the discipline of history. Journalism is a craft and a skill. I learned on the job. Perspective, ways of seeing, exploring, seeking, understanding. That I got from history. That I got from the study of history. Three, the history I was trained in was always with a focus on how ordinary people lived and experienced it in their times. That is a socio-economic, cultural, political lens that placed the mass of the people at the center, taught me to explore how they did, how over long extended periods, they made history, even if we don't recognize that in our history books. By the way, this it's one of the reasons I'm skeptical of BMN courses in journalism, honestly. We see youngsters barely out of their teens being asked to cover very complex issues, pitchforked into covering parliament in very serious uh, matters when, you know, they haven't done a basic degree where they're told what is a bicameral legislature, what, what are, how different a Rajya Sabha is from a Lok Sabha. I've always believed journalism is a postgraduate course of study following a sound social sciences or humanities degree. 
There's also this question, is journalism a social science, as in an applied social science, or just an offshoot of the humanities, a wild offshoot, as in literature in a hurry? You know, there are many, uh, that's a different conversation though. I've actually written a small paper on it very recently, very small, uh, explaining where I think journalism stands. But what we can say is that the best of journalism, apart from the cliches about journalism being the first rough draft of history, the best journalism has always dealt with subalterns. Sent, it centers the lived experience of ordinary people in their times. I would say good journalism is that which engages with the great processes of its time. Incidentally, on April 22nd, we will be, well, some of us will be, because most people are not aware of it, uh, observing the 200th year of the first truly high profile Indian journalist venture that held out, lasted, had a tremendous impact. Most people in teaching journalism history start with Hickey's Gazette, the Bengal Gazette. Hickey was no Indian and he was largely concerned with what was what the European community in India was doing and the scandals in the governor general's court. I think the real Indian journalism worth remembering begins with Raja Ram Mohan Roy, with his publication Mirathul Akbar, which again, uh, I always feel bad about letting down my Bengali friends. It was not in Bengali, it was in Persian, which was the, then the language of the Mughal court, the language of the elite. But here was a journalist who knew, mastered, could write in 10 languages. Towards the later part of his life, he learned French and won praise from French writers for how, how, I mean, how well he expressed himself in that language. I don't know whether that was in writing or in speech, but he knew 10 languages. He did his own translations often from Bengali to English and vice versa. I would say, I'd repeat, good journalism is that which engages with the great processes of its time. From day one, both Sang, uh, Kaumudi Sangbad and, uh, and uh, Mirathul Akbar engaged with what kind of issues? Yeah. Female infanticide and uh, ending sati as a practice. Um, social reform in its deepest and finest sense. But the thing with this, of course, if you say good journalism is that which engages with the great processes of its time which is my definition. I'm not even sure it's a definition, it's more a description. I'm afraid that rules out some 90% of what parades itself as journalism today. But if we did apply that definition, we would be reclaiming as journalists, as the greatest of Indian journalists, a Mahatma Gandhi, a Baba Saheb Ambedkar, how many journalists, and these were working journalists, they ran publications, they established them. They had to worry at the end of the day whether their electricity would be shut off, whether the printing press would be, they would come to find it barred and locked by the British. And how many journalists can claim anywhere in the world to have published 100 volumes or more of collected works? Or take, for me, the most inspirational figure of Indian journalism, which is not known to many historians and students of history as a journalist. We recognize him as a hero, as a martyr, as an activist, as a revolutionary. He was all of those. How many of us know, how many of us know that Bhagat Singh was a professional journalist? Hmm? A professional journalist who wrote in four languages equally fluently in four languages, in Punjabi, in Urdu, in English, and in Hindi, 
and in his last months in prison before being hung, he learned Persian. While underground in Bengal, while escaping the British news, he uh, learned Bengali and I believe he wrote a couple of articles, but then the man wrote so many articles under pseudonym, it's going to be impossible to put his work together. But just imagine, he wrote in the Akali, uh, in Punjabi, he wrote in uh, 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 Veer Arjun, he wrote in Kirti, the uh, theoretical journal, he wrote in Pratab, not the Pratab, daily Pratab of today, but one which closed in the late 40s. Now, all these three journalists, and they were journalists, you know, I don't think, I think it's incredibly patronizing to deny them the fact that they were journalists. They all engaged with the great processes of our time, fighting British imperialism, Purna Swaraj, Ambedkar engaged with the great process that we still grapple with, the greatest fight for human dignity on the face of this earth, the fight of, against untouchability and caste discrimination or the annihilation of caste. Now, note that every one of them engaged with the great processes of our time. What are the great processes of our time and what are we actually covering? It took 10 years, you know, I, I mean, I, as the guy who did it, it took seven years at least from year 2000 or 10, if you count it from 98, to place the issue of farmers' suicides on the national agenda. For six years of those seven, it was dismissed. It was dismissed as, oh, it's not any different from, in fact, many people including academics, still try to dismiss it as something no different from suicide rates in other communities, but I won't even go there today. The other, probably the greatest process of our time in India is the growth of inequality. In fact, two months, less than, a, less than two months ago, you had the World Inequality Report with Thomas Piketty, Louis Chancel, etc. from Paris. Apart from any number of Oxfam and other reports telling us that India is a more unequal society than it has been since the times of height of the British Raj. Yeah. And now, so where are these great processes getting covered? That inequality, by the way, the Times of India, the country's largest newspaper, responded to that with an editorial saying inequality is not a bad thing. So, you know, it's not a bad thing. It spurs competitiveness. It, it's just bizarre that when the bastions of advanced capitalism are worrying about inequality and the World Economic Forum, a, a multi-billionaires club, is talking, is being forced to confront the issue, we celebrate it. And how we construct, it's all, see how we construct the history of India under the reforms from 1991 is critical to this attitude. We have never ever looked at neoliberal globalism in the media and in much of academia from the point of view of those it impacted adversely, which is the bottom 50% of your population whose ownership of total household wealth today is barely 6%. The bottom 30%, if you look at the, French, uh, the Swiss multinational bank, Credit Suisse, every year it brings out a global wealth data handbook. The bottom 30%, their wealth has turned negative in the last 10 years. They're deep in debt. Okay, and here with this attitude, with this mindset, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of Indian freedom. Um, the 75th by constructing heroes who never existed, stories that are so blatantly untrue, 
we have turned into we have turned into uh, uh, you know you know celebrities of the freedom struggle those who were collaborators of the british raj yeah and this is what we are going to tell future generations as we busily rewrite the textbooks to construct a, a narrative in fact one version of that is that india's freedom struggle began 800 years ago so but the more horrible version of it is that people who were who turned police approvers against their comrades in the freedom struggle people who turned state's evidence in the horrible trials like lahore trial and other things um, the meerat treason trial I mean, these people are now being positioned as freedom heroes of your freedom struggle. There's always been, till the 70s, a problem with how we covered the hero uh, freedom struggle itself. In that, it was about half a dozen people whose names found their way into the textbook, all of whom were very genuine heroes of freedom. The Gandhis, the Nehrus, all of them, yes. But we never understood or we never sought what the Mahatma himself understood from the first day of his first visit to Chaparan, that you will never, ever have a hope of achieving freedom against the mightiest empire in the world if you cannot bring the energies and strength of the mass of the peasantry and workers into the struggle. And who was to tell their history? Who was to tell their history? That's what. That's where that African saying comes back to me. If lions were historians, the tales of the jungle would not always favor. So what I would like to do in the little time I have today is to introduce you to something that I, uh, Dr. Anuradha mentioned. I'm doing a book, a profile of 12 or 15 ordinary people. They weren't great leaders. And after the freedom struggle, they went back to being farmers, tailors, mochis, gardeners, you know, like the people of Panimora. Yet, as Gandhi understood perfectly well, freedom was never to be had if they were not the frontline troops of that struggle. So um, in the People's Archive of Rural India, by the way, please notice that I'm a journalist who titles his publication an archive, yeah, um, because it is. It's both a living, breathing archive and a journal of journalism of contemporary events and uh, contemporary happenings. Now, we, in, in the last few years, and I think one of the great tragedies of the 75th anniversary we are on the cusp of losing India's golden generation. Yeah? The, the finest role models whom we never stood before our children because the last living freedom fighters. The youngest I know is 94, the oldest 104, Doreswami in Karnataka. Yeah? In five years' time, maybe six, seven at the best, no Indian child will be privileged to see, listen to, hear, talk to a genuine bona fide freedom fighter because of whom you and I can have this discussion today. Now, who were these people? You know, one of, one of the things that African saying always reminds me of is the complete complete dismissal of the Adivasi uprisings in this country. Long before there was a Congress party or a political movement, the, and also the complete marginalization of the fights for freedom in the South. You know, so much of the freedom struggle is told as a struggle in the Hindi belt and up North. How many even today, really give the, tell you the story of Kataboman, 
How many tell you the story of Aluri Sita Ramaraju in Andhra Pradesh? Well, but that's another book I'm doing. But uh, here I'm looking at fantastic people, some of whom are still alive, and I want pe young people to know who these are. And I'm going to quickly share with you a uh, present, a small slide presentation of some of these people. Let me tell you who they are. Um, what do these people have in common sitting in Maharashtra, in Odisha, in Koraput, in Tamil Nadu, 20 and one absolutely hale and hearty person at 101, going on 101, 20 minutes drive from Loyola College in Chennai and Sankaraya. You should get him to talk to your students sometime. The finest student of Madurai, of American College Madurai, top student, never completed his degree between before 15 days. Oh, he was the founder of the Tamil Poetry Society of American College Madurai, which became famous. He was the top debater. He was the top student and arrested 15 days before final exams, came out on August 14, 1947. I think, and I want to make this point that I think it's a bloody shame that the Madurai, American College Madurai has not recognized its greatest alumnus with an honorary degree, where the state of Tamil Nadu has given him its equivalent of the Bharat Ratna after Chief Minister Stalin came to power. I think it's a crying shame. It shows you your contempt and your, you know, ignorance of your own history and your freedom. So that's one person. I am go going to talk to you very quickly about uh, the, yeah. Please tell me that you can see the screen. Yes, sir, we can see it right now. It's visible, sir. Yeah. So um, I'm showing you one after the other. See, in Pari, we have a whole section, Foot Soldiers of Freedom. This is Hausa by Patil, now 94. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, she died from five months ago. She was with the revolutionary underground that carried out. By the way, we marginalize women freedom fighters like we marginalize women in everything else in our society. She was with the revolutionary underground that carried out audacious attacks on British officers, looted armories, buses and police stations in the Satara region. Between 1943 and 46, Hausa Thai was part of teams of revolutionaries that attacked the trains and one of the greatest robberies was, I'll come to the next person, but Hausa Thai crossed the river Mandovi at midnight at its widest part, infested with crocodiles. Even now it has its crocodiles. And that was the 1943 when it was all jungle to go to Goa, Portuguese held Goa to, to buy weapons to come back and fight the British in Maharashtra. Now, Hausa by story, individual story. Well, you can always go up and look at it here. Yeah, you, you can look at uh, Hausa Bai's story here. Oops. Uh, I'm sorry, I restart the program. I'm just taking a mom moment, please. Yeah. Uh, I think it's lost the share. So let me get back to it and share. Yeah, I, I, you can, I've made links for you to be able to go to the story, but it seems to be having some glitch. I'll send you this, these slides. You can go there. Now, Hausa Bai, um, Hausa Bai, Slide, yeah. Actually, pulled off a spectacular thing, pretending to be a bro, a beaten and battered wife in Sangli, and her husband was thrashing her in front of the police station. 
the police would not intervene because you know wife beating is a national sport in this country and they didn't bother until the hus- drunken husband picked up a rock and said i'm going to smash your head now they didn't want a murder on their doorstep so then the cops came out of the station scolded both of them forced a reconciliation and told them now get out of our sight go back to your village and hausa bai and her husband said oh we don't have any money this guy has drunk everything she said how will we go back the cops escorted them to the railway station which was just behind them put them on a train bought their tickets waved them goodbye and when they returned they found that hausa bai's comrades had looted the police station of all the arms and money it had which was then subsequently used in the satara uprising of 1943 against the british that is hausa bai patel who will tell hausa bai's story and who will deny her contribution to in, to uh, you know indian uh, this i'm even more sad to tell you that he died 3 weeks ago captain bhau captain elder brother in the whirlwind army at 94 that time he was 94 when he died he was 3 months away from completing his husband is 100 and he pulled off with the he led the underground armed forces of the prati sarkar the provisional government of satara which declared secession from the british empire in 1943 this man led an an army and he would get very angry with me if i said underground he said we were not underground in the 600 villages we controlled the british were raj was underground and just a total warrior he pulled off the greatest train robbery perhaps in indian history when he and the tufan sena without a gun stopped the mumbai the pune mirage special goods train carrying the payroll of the boom, uh, one of the payrolls of the british uh, bombay presidency and distributed it to starving peasantry and workers it was the famine year in india and look at this beautiful uh, the the most beautiful thing captain bhau ever told me was we fought for two things we fought for independence and we fought for freedom we achieved independence freedom is still the monopoly of a few we dreamed of bringing freedom to the common man it was a beautiful dream we did achieve independence but i don't think the dream of freedom was ever realized today the man who has money rules this is the state of our freedom captain bow it's true they held out 600 villages held out against the british raj which was on the defensive in europe with an imminent nazi invasion of england this man is still alive i met him a few months ago i met him last november stunning character in his his participation in the freedom struggle begins at age 11 he was a top student of class 3 he was a little kid okay at that time i think he was aged 11 you were older in the rural areas at school years uh he and he won a prize for being the top student so the uh, munshi the education officer something like your top district education officer came to distribute uh prizes on the prize day war had just begun in europe 1939 war had just begun in europe he was 11 as he went on and he, the prize by the way was a shiny one paisa coin incidentally you could buy stuff with one paisa in that year and uh, it, you can even see that it had a role by the fact that there was a half paisa coin as well anyway he won the shiny coin the munshi told him be proud shout give the slogan britannia zindabad hitler murdabad um bhagat singh jugia accepted his prize turned to the audience and shouted 
ब्रिटानिया मुर्दाबाद हिंदुस्तान जिंदाबाद ही वॉज क्रैश्ड बाई दी एजुकेशन ऑफिसर देन एंड देर इन ऑन द स्टेज द रेस्ट ऑफ द स्टूडेंट एब्सोल्यूटली स्टन यंग लिटल थिंग्स इन प्राइमरी स्कूल फ्लेट द हॉल he was expelled and a letter was issued by the education department calling this 11 year old kid a dangerous revolutionary but by the way that's exactly what they made him of made him into and he fought the as part of the revolutionary underground he fought the murder and massacre of minorities in the uh, partition he fought against all these things yeah. and he is still active during the farmers protest i went to his house he was collecting rice oil in hoshiarpur to be sent to the farmers protests in delhi and he was very of course angry and oh for 10 years he was one of the top targets on the hit list of khalistani terrorists they came up to his house when one one of the terrorists realized who he was and that he had helped so many of them as youngsters he refused to carry on the attack but there were other assassination attempts he comes through all this and he told me one thing the politic the none of the people running the country hold any legacy of the freedom movement the political forces they represent they were never there in they were never there in the uh, struggle for independence and freedom not one of them they will destroy this country if not checked but believe me the sun will set on this raj too this is pani mora the village with the largest number of tamra patra winners in the country 74 they took over the court on gandhi's call in the quit india movement they created these are one of them is still alive i'm going to be seeing him in 5 days uh, they are they still gather every friday in the temple and that village had an incredible role but they they captured the sambalpur court dismissed all cases telling people to telling all petitioners to redo the petitions in the name of mahatma gandhi republic of india that was the pani mora this was salihan an astonishing adivasi woman who led an uprise she died but uh, i mean After, and she died 2 3 years after i met her she and her village with lattis to con a, a a brigade of platoon of british officers with lattis in nawapada odisha she died in poverty and in hunger sakkaraya sitting 20 minutes from your loyola college if if 20 minutes maybe even less but i think you can say 20 minutes i have already told you about him you know so here is this fantastic guy who never completed his degree yeah a top student but more of a scholar than most of those who did complete their degrees this lovely foot soldier i just love this man he died at 99 um he was an underground courier or he was a courier of the underground okay he was a courier of the underground he uh, and he used to do his he used to take food into the revolutionary to the revolutionaries in the forest i was mostly a courier taking messages and meals to the revolutionaries siding in the forest several of those long dangerous journeys were on foot he was then he began using a cycle would you believe we have a film of him at 97 late later almost 98 still cycling 20 kilometers a day and on a 55 year old cycle the uh, ganpati ishwara patil still alive in kolhapur and a, a farmer an architect i mean a, a guy who also learned to build barrages and create the some of the more successful irrigation uh, experiments in western maharashtra one more thing among many of these people they refused the pension ganpati patel they refused the freedom fighters pension sankaraya refused the freedom fighters pension when given the 10 lakh prize by chief minister stalin sankaraya accepted the prize 
and gave the money to the chief minister's welfare fund. Okay, as he said, uh, as Ganpati Patil said, how could we accept the pension? We fought for this country's freedom, not for pensions. Uh, Lakshmi Panda. Uh, I, I can't think of her and my meetings with her without tears coming to my eyes. The one Odia woman who fought in the INA, Netaji Bose's Indian National Army. All to the end of her life, she was fighting for recognition. She said, I don't want a pension. I don't want your money. I want to be recognized as somebody who fought for her country's freedom. And well, anyway, I, there are many other, there are little villages who were the centers of some of the greatest uprisings in Indian history, like the one in Godavari, Ram, the Rampa Ramachodavaram, um, you know, Rampa Chodavaram area, the tract where Aluri Sitarama Raju led a fantastic battle against the British, many battles which he won. Sherpur in Uttar Pradesh, where you saw the eight people die for carrying the flag and hoisting it on the collectorate. Um, Kaliyashari, where the freedom movement started in Kerala around young Sumakan, a Dalit, Dalit boy, beaten up by the gundas of the Janmi for trying to enter a school. Father C.F. Andrews went down there. Gandhi went there later, but Andrews went immediately after the beating. This was, these are some of the foot soldiers of freedom. This is, I'm trying to tell you their stories, or rather, I'm trying to get them to tell you their stories in the book, which I hope will be out a month before August 15th. In the 75th year, has perhaps hopefully a counter narrative to the fakery going on in the name of history. See this, all of them were such ordinary people. The Pani Mora, there was a tailor, a cobbler, a Mali, you know, I mean, these were carpenter. I think it's the tailor or someone who is still alive, Jack Pradhan. So this was the this was the freedom struggle from below. These were the everyday people. How many of I mean, how many of us ever reflect on the fact that women freedom fighters, the Lakshmi Pandas, the Salihan, who you know took on an armed British platoon with lapis, leading forty other young Adivasi women at age she was barely sixteen at that time. And by the way, when the state of Odisha recognized her. They gave her a freedom certificate in her father's name. Okay, she was the hero. She was the, I mean, her father was a freedom fighter, born on Friday, but they called her the daughter of the great so and so, so and so, when she led that uprising. And she led it, by the way, because she came to the village to find her father lying on the street, having been shot in the thigh by the British who were marauding the village. And they had destroyed the entire food store of the village as a punishment for the father's participation in the freedom struggle. These are the kind of people, you know, when we show Captain Bao's film in the colleges and schools, very, very often these undergrad kids are in tears because they cannot bring themselves to believe that no one ever put such role models before them and that such people still existed, were still alive. After we did the Lakshmi Panda story, school after school in Koraput invited her to raise the flag on August 15 and January 26, which was the one consolation she had when she died, that her own people recognized. Okay, So I'm saying, I think that this is our, my exploration of subalternism, if you like, I mean, you can call it what you like, but this is what I'm talking about in foot soldier, the last heroes, foot soldiers of freedom, honor them. Two of them are in your city, two of them. Comrade N. Sankaraya and he, I mean, he, you know, and his, uh, uh, from the other political force of the, left of that time are Nallakannan. 
astonishing man who really fought for the land reform in Tamil Nadu, taking over the land from the temple landlords, etc., and distributing it, tortured even after independence by the police in prison on the insistence of the Tanjavur landlords. He's, he's up and about. He came and visited a photo exhibition two weeks ago when I was there. Honor them, cherish them. They made your history. They are your history. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that spellbounding speech that quenched our thirst for knowledge. Your path-breaking speech hope will act as a catalyst for eliminating the darkness of ignorance and for illuminating in us the light of cognizance. We are really awestruck and inspired getting to know about the food soldiers of in this moment. We assure you that we will keep the fl flame burning and carry forward the legacy, sir. Thank you once again, sir. A leader is someone who creates an event. Team members essentially bring life to it. It's time to call forward our conscience keeper, Mr. J. Ranganathan, coordinator, Department of History, Shift 2, to deliver the oath of thanks. Please, sir. Yeah. Good morning. I'm so delighted to be a part of this uh, Loyola Forum for Historical Research. And the theme of this year is echoing the subaltern voices at the national and the regional levels, writing in the modern image writing in the modern Indian history is so timely and fitting. And uh, I, in fact, I, I thank uh, Mr. P. Sainath, the founder editor of the People's Archives of Rural India Party, for giving a, a, very, a very clear view about, uh, you know, the subaltern and also about uh, his career, you know, his journalistic career and also about uh, the unsung heroes in India. And that gives us a right, a comprehensive outlook about right where we are. And you also feel that uh, the new way of defining history is history determines the mindsets, outlook and vision of countries and linkages with others. And Mr. Sainath was talking about India at 75. And at this point of time, we are talking about you know, history, right, in a big way, history at 75. History is not the past, but a map of the past. From a particular point of view, to be used to light. History is who we are, why we are, and the way we are. That is all about history. And Dr. Sainath has beautifully, you know, that uh, outlined about, uh, you know, various aspects, right, uh, about India. And uh, we really admire his talk, and he's a well-known right, uh, speaker. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time and, and coming for this LFHR and inspiring us. I am very sure that students will right, certainly follow you, and we are so grateful and proud of you always. I thank uh, 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 our uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Thomas uh, S.G., the principal of Laila College, for giving freedom you know, to organize LFHR in Laila College. I believe education is power. Education for empowerment, education for development. And that is the way Father always, you know, that tells us that do something, do something, do something. Thank you, Father, for, for being with us all the time and helping us and giving us the right energy, enthusiasm to conduct events in the campus. I also thank uh, 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 our beloved Deputy Principal, Dr. Mirjus Gyal, always uh, right, encouraging us, motivating us guiding us at every point of time and uh, guiding us always accompanying us accompanying right uh, us always and giving us right more dynamism right in the department thank you so much sir for being with us and encouraging us right, in this point of time and, and then dr Benari swami my own teacher a well-known historian in chennai and uh, always you know that whenever we need any advice or any kind of support uh, he always run to Lister. And he is a man who sits there, okay, I'm here to help you out. And here is a resource person, here is an idea. History is nothing but right, all about ideas. And here is a professor right, who is always known for the, the ideas. And thank you, sir, for giving us you know, such a wonderful uh, opportunity. And that is how you know that we all believe history is a race between you know, that education and catastrophe. 
and today's talk that i talks more about education you know catastrophe and education is this a race in fact and in the race we want education to do you know education to 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 do well right in all institution so thank you so much binat sir for giving us uh, uh, you know this uh, great opportunity i thank uh, dr anuradha taking such great initiative you know uh, all the time you know taking initiatives you know giving us like lot of opportunities for the students to develop thank you madam for this opportunity i thank jeevit and arish for the mc and i thank all the faculty members in the department for giving us you know uh, all the support right? whenever we need right both shift 1 and shift 2 giving all the support for the department to develop i thank all the students both shift 1 and shift 2 teaching and non teaching right for giving us a wonderful support to conduct this loyola forum for historical research so i thank you all for coming <clears throat> and wish you all thank wish you all the best thank you so much thank you Uh, thank you ranga sir and i will just take one moment uh, to thank uh, sai nath sir once again on behalf of uh, the department of history thank you sir thank you for such an uh, inspiring talk that you gave us today and uh, giving us a very uh, uh, clear understanding of the voices which have not been heard uh, we celebrate our freedom but uh, we celebrate our independence but the the contribution of such people have not yet been recognized thank you for uh, being an eye opener to us today and uh, we assure you that we will uh, carry forward the work that you have started we will do our best in uh, uh, as you told uh, recognizing the work of uh, two great uh, people who are amidst us in our state so we will uh, do our part in honoring them uh, we wish you all the very best sir and thank you for joining us today thank you sir Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. I also uh, take this moment to welcome our, uh, our resource persons who are uh, have joined us uh, for this inaugural as well. So I uh, welcome uh, Dr. Gangadharan from Banaras University, uh, Dr. M N Rajesh from uh, Hyderabad University, who were part of the inaugural session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, over to you, Harish. You can uh, conclude. change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time we are the one we have been waiting for we are the change that we seek the end of a story is the new beginning for many others on this note let's proceed to session 1 of this conference the link for the first session is posted in the chat box i wish all the participants to get drenched in the sea of knowledge to quench your inquisitiveness thank you So participants you can uh, move to the first uh, link that is a session one link the link has been posted in the